okay. Um, yeah, I brought, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know the place I'm working, Spru, so I brought a number of brochures for those who want to know more. Uh, we basically work on uh, innovation. Um, I only arrived um, last year, so I'm new to the place, uh, but I have a twofold background. Uh, one is in transition studies, and this figure now is iconic, I think, for uh, transition studies. And the other is I'm an historian of technology. Uh, and the question is, how do I relate to the emerging or established mobility paradigm? Um, well, transitions research, this figure came out of a group of people, in fact. It's not related to Frank Hales, but in fact, it was a group of people working on the question of radical change. And the question was, how does radical change come about? Because the idea was that sustainable, we were asked by the uh, government, the Dutch government, uh, whether we could think of new policies because the environmental policy was clearly not working and they needed new policies to how to think about sustainable development. And the uh, answer we gave uh, was we need system change. So you cannot globalize and further develop the current mobility system, energy system. So how does uh, system change come about? Well, you need a change of a social technical regime. That's the core uh, concept. And the basic idea here is that people, agents, are driven by routines. So we are not driven by rational decisions. We are not driven by ideology, ideology perception. Uh, we are basically driven by routines. And these routines are embedded in the material world, but also in regulations, in policies. And these, all these things are aligned. And, and therefore, it's very difficult to change. So these are the genes of systems, and you need to change them because you get other reproduction patterns. So that was the basic idea. How does a change of a social technical regime come about? It comes about through the interaction between these three levels. And I don't want to go into this now, uh, but it will come back later on. Uh, but that was the, that's the kind of background. It's also action-oriented, because the Dutch state asked us to come up with an answer of uh, they didn't follow our uh, uh, prescriptions. At first they did. So we filed a court case against them. Three weeks ago, we were told we won. So we filed a court case against them because they were not acting on climate change. Uh, they were not doing enough. The court, the Dutch court, go online and find it is now demanding the Dutch state to take action. Uh, so this is partly an outcome uh, of this, not partly, it is an outcome of this research. Okay, well, this is not working. Okay, well, as an historian, I've been involved in uh, history of transport, and this is a uh, here a uh, the train is uh, arriving, uh, a new train is arriving uh, for the first time in a village in the Netherlands. So opening up the village to modernity is the is the is the basic message conveyed by uh, this picture. Um, so this, uh, so the train in the 19th century was seen as a revolutionary new development because it was recognized that mobility uh, would really free people because people were always uh, bounded by the land. They could not leave socially. So it was also recognized by the old regime as something that needed to be contained because it has re would have revolutionary consequences if people could move. Uh, so it is mobility, in a way, is very core to modernity. Uh, the, the work I have been doing the over the last 10 years is showing how uh, mobility has been core, in fact, to the history of Europe. Because there are two types of histories history of Europe. One is the European integration history, which talks about uh, what happened after the Second World War. And it's a struggle between a nation state and a technocratic super state. And we see that in the news every day. The other history of Europe is the history of nation states. And they are compared. So the history of the UK, the history of France. But there's another history of Europe possible, and history of Europe that emerged through mobility. 
So we looked at how infrastructures, like railway infrastructures, communication infrastructures, uh, led to a new promise of a new kind of unification uh, that would unite people in Europe, prevent peace, and bring prosperity. Basically, a very, very positive message connected to mobility. The question, of course, is whether this positive message is justified. And as we know, the mobility in the 19th century <coughs> didn't bring a peace, but there were two world wars <coughs> instead. Uh, OK. So this is a bit of my background. So what I, uh, because I arrived uh, at SPU last year, and uh, I've not done a lot of research uh, last year, but I'm just starting now a new uh, research project, which is about the role of users in these historical transformations and in transitions. <coughs> because a lot of this research somehow assumes that the consumer, it's often called the consumer, is passive. And the question whether that is justified, what is the role of the user, in fact, in mobility, but also in, well, for me, in transitions and in historical transformations? Well, this is a, one example of a, uh, of a transition. So what you see here, this is, these are, this, is the, this is about the Netherlands. This is the car, this is the bicycle, this is the train, this is walking, this is the motor pad. Uh, so this is 1950. Here you see the transport performance. So you see in 1950 we had a society where people were walking longer distances in total than driving by a car. 1950. You see the dominant transport mode was bicycling. Uh, then a train, then walking then train, uh, then bus, and then car. So the fifth place. You see in 10 years, and you see here, you, this is 15, this is 120 billion kilometers. Uh, so you see we had to break it up the graph. So you see in 10 years, the, the car becoming completely dominant. In 10 years time, between 1950 and 1960, we see what we call a transition complete radical change of social technical regime. And the question is, how this is possible? Well, the story is, the kind of traditional story, is we got mass production, the T4, basically, but people could not afford it in the uh, 20s and 30s yet, so we needed an economic growth for people to start buying the car. So what happened here was because it became cheaper, the car, and people could afford it after the Second World War. So an, ec an, ec an economic explanation, and it's all based on price. And the history is, we first got mass production. It needed a complement, and of course Keynes is often seen as part of this too, because you need demand side. So then you need, uh, so what we wanted to explore this history is if it, if it is correct, and the kind of history uh, I'm developing now is to show that not Ford was the core of the car revolution, but the user. Um, okay, so this is also this story about from mass production to mass consumption is also connected to the linear model. I will not go into that because it's uh, and we don't have a lot of time. So uh, in the paper I'm developing there are five types of user roles. Uh, during the transition. One is providing legitimation for the transition. The other is producing it and tinkering with it. The other is <coughs> lobbying for it. Acting as an intermediary means bringing production and consumption together. I will give examples. And then we have the user-consumer, the kind of traditional role is often assumed in the literature. Well, this is another picture that tries to talk about uh, transitions. So the idea is that transitions emerge in small niches. And a normal diffusion curve is always about number of adopters. So what we, uh, here is another X. This is stability of the rules within a regime. So if people are routine driven, routines can be more or less stable. So here you have very stable routines 
and you have, and as we assume a kind of relationship between stability of, well, it can be a relationship and, and number of adapters. So the assumption is in a transition, before you get a lot of adap adoption, you first need to, to get more stable rules. So you first develop in niches more stable rules, emerging of a new, at the same time, you need an erosion of the existing routines. So these two processes are happening in parallel, and then you get a wider breakthrough, uh, if it happens at all, of course. Uh, well, the car emerged as a racing machine, creating a lot of dust. The roads were not uh, built for cars. And these people uh, were also uh, creating many difficulties. People were fr throwing stones at them. Uh, there were many cities that closed their streets. Uh, so, because it was really seen as a racing machine. So this is what we call a niche. And the thing is that many of these users building their own cars. Uh, they were also built by companies, but then they were tinkered with uh, a lot. Uh, so, uh, so users were very important here. And another type of use which emerged, because the users started to organize clubs, so the consumption of the car at first was a collective experience, so they were touring into the countryside. So the idea was that the urban life was bad for your health, and because of that you need to explore nature. And how to explore nature by collective touring using the car. So this was a collective exploration of the nature. And you see here, they push away the horse carriage. So it's a very symbolic uh, picture in that sense. Uh, part of the early car experience was that it often broke down. So this was seen as positive. This was part of the masculine uh, experience of the car because you had to uh, repair it. Uh, but often the people, uh, you know, they had chauffeurs so the chauffeurs were partly doing the repairs, although they were boosting about their own capabilities. Uh, and here you find uh, another uh, tinkering with the car, because this the people bought a T-Ford and they rebuilt it. So many buses and tractors and these kind of cars were rebuilt by the users. For, 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 uh, so there was a lot of uh, user activity. Uh, so what we have seen until now, and this is in the first phase of a uh, transition, is on the one hand the users uh, provide legitimation because they connected uh, the car to the idea of exploring nature and being sportive, which was part of the emerging uh, modernity. But they also were very actively involved in developing the machine itself, in fact. Uh, so this is the user producer tinkerer, uh, but then the car needed more because a car on its own can hardly function and it needed uh, roads for car only, which was a really big invention, the idea that you can build a road on which uh, people cannot walk, are not allowed to walk. This was a complete new concept that did not exist, the motorway or the highway. Uh, this was the first, this was uh, a picture of the Netherlands, uh, of a, a design, was the first design of a highway in 1923. It was would be built completely elevated throughout the Netherlands. This was a kind of engineering dream. It's also about flow, of course, because the cars can drive very, very fast. They are not interrupted. 